spiritual warfare is millenniums old. The fight of good and evil has been there since the beginning. It's literally God versus the devil fought through the people. Okay. Takže. Rapido, rapido. We're going to do what we can here. Next section. The principle of clarity. Clarity of objective precedes all other elements in strategic thinking. Here are some questions that you can use repeatedly to focus aby sa koncentroval and clarify your objectives. A objasnil svoje ciele. See, people don't believe Christianity should have organization. Ľudia neveria, že kresťanstvo by malo mať nejakú organizáciu. And it needs to. Ale to potrebuje. Now, not too much organization. Nehovorím, aby to malo priveľa organizácie. But God is organized. Ale Boh je organizovaný. God is systematic. Boh je systematický. God has systems in place. Boh má systémy, ktoré fungujú. This whole world has systems. A celý tento svet má systémy. That God set in place. Ktoré Boh ustanovil. The sun rises. Slnko vychádza. The sun sets. Slnko zapadá. Time. Čas. Systems all over the place. You have an electrical system. A plumbing system. Everything's run off systems. But you don't have to be so rigid. But you do need to have strategies. The devil has strategies. And this is a lot of the reason why Christians haven't been successful. It's because they haven't had clarity and object or um, uh, objectives. So here's a few questions you can ask yourself. What am I trying to do? I'm just letting them write it down. How am I trying to do it? Ako sa to snažím urobiť? And why am I doing it? A prečo to robím? Live by those three questions. Žiť týmito troma otázkami. What? Čo? How? Ako? And why? A prečo? Am I doing what I'm doing? To robím, čo robím. If you're getting yourself free, ak sa niečo oslobodí, or getting others free, iný, these questions will help you stay focused. Tieto otázky ti pomôžu byť koncentrovaný. Working with a clear mind, keď sa and clear objectives will keep you and the team on task and mission. The vision must be clear and concise. Do you guys have goals that you've set in your lives? Do you, do you live by goals? Because most of the people, most people just exist. You, you need long-term goals. And you need short-term goals. And those goals need to be clear. You can't always have massive goals without short-term goals. Because some of those big goals take a long time to get to. And sometimes, though you don't think you're ever going to get there, because the road is so long. So this is why you have little checkpoints. Say you have a really long drive. And you want to break up that drive because your drive is 30 hours. Well, you're not always going to drive 30 hours straight. So you might break up those 30 hours in three 10-hour days. So, you know, the mission and the objective is to get to where you're going. You could call that your, your big-term goal. Your, your, your end goal. But you have the little checkpoints in between. 
Those are the little things you need to live by every day. A to sú tie malé veci, ktoré potrebuje žiť každý deň. Set goals for yourself every okay. single day. Dávaj si cieľe sám pre seba každý jeden deň. Because then you will live with a sense of accomplishment. Lebo vtedy budeš žiť s pocitom, že si niečo dosiahol. It's, it's amazing and this may sound silly. Je to uchvátne, možno to bude znať trošku také, také smiešné. Maybe you've done this. Možno si to už urobili. But, ale for some people, pre niektorých ľudí washing dishes umývanie or, or doing laundry alebo umývanie oblečenia is a huge task. Je to obrovská úloha. So they let it pile up and pile up and pile up. Tak sa ich tam skladí a hromadí. And pretty soon they just don't even know where to start. But if you did a little bit like every day, you would never have that problem. Now it's a very minor thing. But for some people it's not. But you need to set these little goals for yourself every day. And then you always go to bed with a sense of accomplishment. You know, on your way to a big term goal, whatever it is. You know, if you want to save a million souls, you may look at it and go, how do I get a million people, Lord? That's a lot of time. A lot of focus. A lot of effort. But how do you save a million souls? One soul at a time. A mini goal that you can live by on a regular basis and live by a sense of accomplishment every day. There's so many people that feel nothing. That they're numb. Because they just exist. Set some goals. And have a sense of like self-worth. They don't always have to be spiritual goals and soul winning and all that kind of stuff. I, I have a lot of spiritual goals. But I have a lot of call them normal goals, I guess. I don't know. Call If I'm outside chopping wood, splitting wood, I can show you pictures. We got piles of it. And it's 35-40 degrees in the summer. And people think you're crazy. Why don't you go down and get in the water? It's 40 degrees outside. Because I set a goal for myself. That I would get this split today. Because nobody wants to be split in wood at minus 30. It's Canada in the winter. It's cold. It's not fun splitting wood in three feet of snow. So it, you do it in the summer so you can burn it all winter. And I have goals. I got to get this done no matter what. And you work through it. And you get it done. And you have a sense of accomplishment. Now, I love snowmobiling. Snowmobiling. I love extreme sports. I love speed. The faster I can go, the better it is. We were on the Autobahn. But I'm driving a big van. And 170. The van started to go like this. And I have passengers with me. So I didn't go any faster. But I would have. If the van wasn't so big. Anyway. Snowmobiling. We live in the mountains. And so these aren't spiritual goals. But they're living with goals every day of your life. So I try to set certain goals all the time. Now I'm not going to tell you what all my goals are. None of your business. Okay. So we we live we go 3,000 meters high. 
Three, four thousand meters in the sky, in the air. Climbing mountains. In ten feet of snow. And sometimes I've been buried in the snow this deep. And you're so stuck in the snow. Who, who rides snowmobiles? Anybody rides snowmobiles in here? Come on, anybody? Okay, it's fun, right? In, in, the, in, the, in the mountains? Yes. So sometimes we bury the snowmobiles so deep that the skis are pointing to the sky. It's a lot of work. It's very hard work. And we look at these mountains. And I'm like, that looks dangerous. But I'm setting a goal. I'm going to climb that mountain. And you just get on and you, and you get it done. In the grand scheme of things, does that matter? Not at all. But it matters to me. Why? Because I conquered it. It's little tiny things like that. No matter what you're doing, I set goals. If I'm writing a book, I set a goal to get this section done today. Whatever it is. If, like I said, if you're traveling, we have a goal to get to this location. And if you do that, every day, you will live with a sense of accomplishment. And then you won't feel empty. And it's easy. Set just little goals. Anyway, we'll move past that. Do you get, do you get what I'm saying though? And it will help you with clarity of mind. You won't, you won't just be numb and oh my God. I did nothing all day today. You can look at the fruits of your labor. And you can say, look what I accomplished today. Do it every day. Now. Uh, the vision must be clear and concise. The vision must be communicated with clarity and in a timely manner so all can understand, even a child. That's why the mission has to be clear. Not convoluted or, or cloudy. Gray or undefined areas will muddy up the waters and people will not see clearly. People need a clear vision to follow. Okay. Now, we're going to look at the principle of surprise. We could spend more time on these, but I'm just, I want to get through some of this. Now, the principle of surprise. You get surprised all the time. You're driving to work and your car breaks down. Surprise! You know? So the enemy will use the, the principle of surprise against you. It's designed to catch you off guard. Does anybody like scaring people here? Like if your wife's walking through the house, you go boom or something, you know? <laughs> to surprise, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it, okay, there's a couple of us. It's kind of funny. It, it's a little bit funny. Okay, we, we, my wife does that to me, actually. It's kind of funny. Most of the time. Okay, so she actually, I got to tell a story. The other, where were we just recently? Was that? Sweden. Were we in Sweden? Malmo. In Malmo, Malmo, Sweden. And I, it was dark in the hotel room. And I got up for a minute. And then I had to go back into bed. But I didn't want to turn the lights on because she was sleeping. She wasn't sleeping. She hid in the closet. And tried to scare me. I didn't even know. 
I get into bed and all of a sudden I feel something land on me. Why did you throw on me? A shoe or something? I'm like, why is there a shoe on me? And she's like, I tried to scare you in the closet. I was like, oh, I wasn't scared, you know. <laughs> but so this just we have fun. We're, we're, listen, I've been with her most of my life. <laughs> you can't have fun. It's hilarious. It was hilarious. I just didn't know what was going on because I lay in bed and then something hits me. And I said to her, I said, listen, don't, don't jump out in the dark. We're in a strange country. I want to be responsible for something I wouldn't want to do. Don't do that. So anyway, but if I, if she were to say to me, I'm just about to scare you. Would I be scared? No, because I'm, I'm expecting it. So when you scare somebody, it's a surprise. So that's what the enemy uses against you, is the element of surprise. So remember, these principles work for you or against you. One more thing. If you're not having fun in your marriage, it's going to get old real fast. Have fun together. Laugh together. Cry together. Get mad together if you have to. Not, 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 not at each other. But have fun. Make each other laugh. I will bother her on purpose. Just to make her laugh. It takes a minute or so. But I'll just keep bugging her. And then until she starts laughing. And then I run. No, okay. you know? Just have fun. Have fun together as a married couple. We could be all by ourselves doing absolutely nothing. And still be having fun. You see, that, that's just, then life never gets boring. Anyway, that's a free marriage seminar for you. Okay. Very short marriage Very seminar. But a marriage seminar. Okay. Strike the enemy. Strike the enemy. At the time or place. Or in a manner. For which he will be unprepared. Surprise can decisively shift the balance of combat power. By seeking surprise, forces can achieve success well out of proportion to the effort expended. So you can have a maximum achievement outcome when you're using less forces but the principle of surprise. Because you're catching your enemy off guard. Now, these are tools that I'm trying to give you so you can win the battles against the devil in your life. Apply them or don't apply them. That's up to you. Surprise can be in tempo. Size of force. Direction. Or a location of main effort. And timing. Deception can aid the probability of achieving surprise. This is what happens with the devil all the time. He uses deception. That's all he has. Now, planning is good. But sometimes it can give the enemy time to prepare. Or formulate a defense. Planned. Organized events are necessary. And the enemy is to never be feared. But sometimes using the principle of surprise is necessary as well. 
If one always plans to go minister in the streets or in the marketplace, the enemy can divert people from going to the same place. You've planned to go. A person can go to a location and just start ministering to people with no planning involved. This is using the principle of surprise. If a person always has the same time they pray, the enemy can cause distraction right before that moment. A child may need attention an, an important work call may come in or something may go wrong in the house. Praising the Lord throughout the day at various times will help you keep your mind stayed upon the Lord. <coughs> the enemy cannot stop what he can't see coming. And the enemy cannot stop true faith. He can. He can hinder and try to stop partial faith. But he cannot stop true authority and true faith. Again, there's there's more people here, so I got to tell you that the enemy does not work with your spirit. He, he works in your soul, in your mind, which is the psychological part of you. So he is a spirit, and he affects you in your mind, in your soul, your will, your emotions. And that's how he defeats you. And he can also get your body if he can. But that usually comes through getting your mind first. No. The enemy can derail a habit and schedule. But, but he is defenseless against the principle of surprise. The enemy is a creature of habit. And for the most part, so are people. He can settle into your same old routines and keep hitting you at specific times, keeping you in frustration and distraction. It's cycles. So what can happen with a lot of people is something will go wrong in their life and they'll sit in that for a month, two months, three months and then they'll start coming out of it, start feeling better. Let's say it's depression. You're feeling depressed for two, three months and then you start to come out of it, start feeling a little bit better. Then the enemy comes along and hits you with something else. Or something goes wrong in your life. And you go right back into that cycle. This is how he works. Why? Because then you can never get free. He, he perpetually keeps you in that state of depression. Or, or whatever it is. You, know, you got a pain in your body or something. And then after a while it starts to feel better. And then one day you wake up. And it's all, it's all messed up again. So he will use the principle of surprise. He will use your patterns against you. And he'll use your routines. So maybe you got to mix it up once in a while. He will also use routine to affect your marriage. If you both go to work every day, you come home, you eat some dinner while watching TV, and you watch TV all night long, and then you go, good night, you go to sleep, you wake up the next morning, you go to work, come home, eat dinner, watch TV, 
go to sleep. Do you see? It's a routine. Break that. Your marriage will go stagnant in that. Change it up a little bit. Even something simple like why don't we go out to eat tonight or something, whatever. Why don't we go for a walk somewhere? Why don't we turn off the TV and just talk? Something. You know, I'm telling you, the enemy will use whatever he can. And then you wonder why things aren't so good for you. Yeah. Well, there you go. This is also a great principle for marriage. I didn't know that was coming. Because like I said, I wrote this, but this is the first time I'm reading it. So, marriage can fall into the category of boring and routine. How many women, I'm just joking. Don't, do not put up your hand. Okay, make sure you don't put up your hand. I don't want to cause any fights or arguments. But ask yourselves, men and women, how many of you have a boring marriage where you're just existing? Just think about it. Don't answer me. Because your husband will be like, what do you mean I'm boring? Okay. Anyway. The enemy can use boring and routine to have a person's mind wander for one or both and to start looking for excitement or adventure in another person. Wandering always starts in the mind. Always. Keep things exciting. Take unplanned trips. Get in the car and just drive. Surprise your spouse with a dinner out, like I just said. A drive in the mountain or the countryside. Arrange a babysitter. And just go somewhere. Randomly compliment each other. Um, take a few seconds for a loving embrace. A marriage in ruins will throw everything else off. A marriage in ruins will throw everything else off. A household of disorder will make a ministry of disorder no matter what the appearances may be. This element of surprise can really throw the devil off. Men, husbands, it might even throw your wives off a little bit. Well, I don't know why I'm so focused on marriage here, but whatever. When's the last time you brought her some flowers? Or something that she likes? Or done something out of the ordinary? Man, I might be getting some men in trouble here. I'm trying to help you. Men think different than women. Women need different things than men do. Men are just happy with hitting things and, and, and using tools. And women aren't necessarily like that. Don't just think of yourself. I can tell you the last time I bought my wife flowers. Before we came to Europe. I can tell you the next time I'll give her flowers. When we get back from Europe. I just go to the store. I buy flowers. I bring them home. I cut them in the water. I put them in the vase. And wait till she comes home. It's not hard. Do you see? 
I'm surprising her too. <laughs> now she doesn't come home and go, Oh, my flowers! <laughs> her reaction doesn't even matter. <laughs> It's just that I thought of her. <laughs> Is what's good. <laughs> okay, so. The enemy uses this principle against people every day. Things just randomly pop up. And, pe- and people will say, I was not expecting that to happen. This is the, uh, the often the enemy using the principle of surprise. Now you can't really be ready for a surprise. That's the very nature of a surprise. It's a surprise. But you can have your life set up in such a way that if something comes your way it won't even affect you. It may surprise you but it won't affect you. That's the fiery darts we keep talking about in Ephesians chapter 6. They're coming. It doesn't say that they didn't come. It says that they, you can quench every fiery dart of the enemy. So it means the darts are coming. But they will have no effect on you. If you live right, protect your home, protect your marriage, and live right for God. Men, by God's order, are supposed to be the head of the household. Not dictator, but the godly head of the house living Christ-like. Which means loving your wife as Christ loved the church. If that's not in place, everything else is going to be unbalanced. Now, even God uses the principle of surprise. Luke 12.40 Therefore, be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't expect. Surprise! Surprise! Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9-11 The Lord is not slow concerning His promise as some count slowness as some count slowness but He is patient with us because He doesn't want anybody to perish but I'll come to repentance verse 10 but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night Surprise! It's an element of surprise. Now, live prepared for the coming of the Lord. But try mixing things up in your life and put the devil on his heels. Strike him where he least expects it. Now, quickly we're going to go into uh, the principle of security. Never permit the enemy to acquire an unexpected advantage. Security enhances freedom of action by reducing vulnerability to hostile acts, influence or surprise. Security results from the measures taken by a commander to protect his forces. Our leadership knows that I will protect them. Spiritually and physically. If necessary. My wife knows the same thing. Even though she's tougher than most men, just say. My family knows the same thing. That's why I had the jobs that I did. I've always wanted to protect people. It's, it's, just, it's always been in me. So people that are around me, the principle of security is working. 
Tento princip ochrany funguje. Because I want to take care of her. Protože se chci o ní postarat. This is true. To je pravda. Knowledge and understanding of enemy strategy. Poznání a porozumění nepřátelských tactics. Jeho taktik. Doctrine. Jeho vyučování. And staff planning. Improve the detailed planning of of adequate security measures. This principle works in conjunction with the principle of surprise. God is a strategist, and so is the devil. Okay. Um, just trying to cover there's a few things we need to get to in the last session but um, yeah we'll just go here the enemy clearly knew what Jesus was capable of this is why the devil did everything he could to scare stop or kill Jesus the enemy could not touch Jesus until Jesus chose to lay his life down they tried to throw Jesus off a cliff he walked with them and then he just turned around and walked away he had the principle of security from the father that he was safe because he knew he was going to die on a cross so he was secure in the fact that he wasn't going to get thrown off a cliff or stoned we as believers need to believe and therefore walk in the same manner we have many promises of in the Bible of protection Luke 10 19 look I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you that is God's principle of security do you see Ephesians 6.16 Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you will be able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. Principle of security. Colossians 3.3 For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Security. I could go on all day just on this part of it. Second uh, Thessalonians 3.3 3. But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. Security. But there is a way you have to live for that to take place. You can't just live however you want and then expect God to protect you. It doesn't work. If you have a bodyguard and the bodyguard's job is to protect you day and night and then you sneak off in the middle of the night and run around on your own and something happens to you you can't blame your bodyguard you left do you see so one of the uh, there's a stack of questions that I have up, upstairs that I can't answer now but I'm going to answer at 7 o'clock tonight one of them in, in there the questions was so you're telling me or something like that that sin separates you from God absolutely 100% yes now does sin separate God from you no stand perfectly still don't move this is God meet God see people would say I, I told you God was a female anyway okay. <laughs> this is me if I sin God does not move I move so did God leave me no did God separate himself from me no I separated myself from him so does sin separate you yes because like I said yesterday my fingers aren't touching there's separation there this is sin 
Now, keep doing that more and more and the separation is bigger. It takes time. But the separation will grow bigger. You see? The Bible says that nothing, the people say, well, the Bible says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. True. God will still love you. You ever love somebody from a distance? Doesn't mean you don't love them. You're just not close to them. What's the difference? So yes, sin will separate you from God. Absolutely. It starts. It doesn't separate you in the spirit right away. It separates you in the soul. Because all sin was first psychological. Why? Because like we talked about yesterday, before it's an action, it's a thought. You see how it works? So yes. Which? Well, I'll leave that alone. Okay. I was going to maybe let you know what I'm preaching on here tomorrow morning, but maybe we'll leave that as a surprise. Maybe you have to show up to find out. A uh, couple of things real quick here. First uh, John 5.18 Talking about the principle of security. We know that whoever is born of God does not keep sinning. But whosoever has been born of God, God guards himself and the wicked one cannot touch him. So are you tired of the wicked one touching you? Getting into your life? Working in your life? Are you in sin? The promise here is that the wicked one can't touch you. The condition is you guard yourself by keeping yourself out of sin. That is what it says. It's easy. Principle of security. Well, it's not easy to do. I'm just saying it's easy to say, but sometimes it's not easy to do. Now, we're going to take our last break. And then we're going to do our very best. We're probably going to go um, to talk about leadership. Well, we might get through. We'll see where we go. We're going to, we're going to cover as much as we can. Because I want to give you the principles for you to live by. So you can defeat the enemy instead of him defeating you. Okay? So we'll see you in about 10 minutes or so.